All right, we're, uh, we're going to move from um, William Blake, whom we looked at last time, to William Wordsworth. Um, Wordsworth is, um, in terms of the Romantic movement, considered to be the leading figure. Blake writes before Wordsworth, chronologically speaking, but the Romantic movement is connected with William Wordsworth and also his uh, fellow writer Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, the two men compose a collection of poems called the Lyrical Ballads. And a ballad tells a story to this day in, in, uh, in our music. There are certain types of songs that we call ballads and they tend to um, they tell a little story in a, in a song ty type of uh, fashion. And um, it's not that common in our day. Most pop songs don't tell stories. Uh, they just um, write lyrics that are pretty repetitive without any narrative to them, but lyrical ballads do. And Wordsworth and Coleridge pen these, this collection together. And uh, it is, for its time, rather revolutionary. And it really is a poetic experiment. And the experiment is one that Blake has already as we saw last time, undertaking, uh, which is to present a different form of hero. Um, we'll see, remember I mentioned, and we saw last time with Blake, that the heroes of Blake's poems were not your expected heroes. They're not adult um, princes or kings or uh, philosophers or anyone who is fully accomplished in their, uh, their life, nor even Jesus, if you take Milton's Paradise Lost as a model of a, of a hero. Um, there we have a finished figure. Um, this is a, a role model for you to follow in your life. That's what a hero is. You emulate the completed article. In the Romantics conception of heroism, we have the uh, hero in an embryonic stage, uh, either a child, or most often, even if it is a child, an orphan. And as I say, the orphanage, orphan uh, aspect of the child as hero is helpful because it emphasizes one of the main romantic themes, which is that children uh, are best raising themselves and following their nature, following their own nature, their own natural inclinations, the things that they like and desire, believing that what is natural is good and furthermore, and this is what the first poem by Wordsworth is going to illustrate for us, that social conventions are oppressive and evil. And so we get a certain view of um, culture and of education being promoted strongly in the new poetics of the Romantics. I said to you that the Enlightenment is marked by its pursuit of reason. And the Romantic period is a reaction against the Enlightenment, and it will emphasize feeling instead, the promptings of our, our, our sensations or our feelings, our feelings about ourselves, are uh, valorized to the point where they are uh, leading us. And we ought to follow our feelings, follow our hearts, and we ought not to let the uh, logic of this world, the rationalizing, which goes on amongst us, and particularly the discussion, the conversation, topics of adults, ought not to obstruct us from how we really feel. Now, this may sound very familiar in our day because, of course, that is the uh, main premise behind uh, the new concepts of human nature, namely gender identity, sexual orientation, and so forth. You ought to uh, act in accordance with how you feel about yourself or how you identify yourself as opposed to what is imposed upon you by society. That, that language stems from the romantic sensibilities of this day. Whatever we make of that, I'm just saying there's an origin to this type of, of thinking. And in terms of, of how Christians should think about this, well, obviously there is a problem from an educational vantage point or a challenge, if not a problem. Maybe I'm uh, being a bit tendentious here. Uh, the challenge is that, as I said, 
from the vantage point of Christian theology, but even ancient uh, civilizations or all cultures up to this point, the, mo the model of good living is an adult because they are now complete. They're not just, there's not just potential there, it's actualized potential. And this person, whether it's a, a king or a, uh, or a knight, or in the case of Christ, uh, God himself in human form, um, is no longer held to be the template for how we ought to behave. It's now the child, and the child in a way that is not played out for us. The child will determine for him or herself um, what heroism is going to be. And the, the, the lesson that comes from that is very much in keeping with the Enlightenment, which is that we ought not to trust any authorities when it comes to how we should live our lives best. We will determine. And there is no role model for that. There's no template to which we should ascribe. Now, if that's the case, then education becomes a very different project than it was before. It's not trying to do the best of what has been thought or said or done. Uh, there is no fixed model of goodness or truth or beauty. We will determine what those things are as we live our lives. So it becomes very much experiential learning in, in the sense not of just, as it says in scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good, but taste and see what you think is good. And whatever you determine to be good is your good. And there is no way of criticizing that from that, this vantage point. So it is very challenging and it is very influential. And it is to be found uh, not just in our education system, but in our churches. Whatever feels right to you must be right because you feel it strongly. Now from the historic vantage point, here we have a, a, a real challenge because the, the feelings, or uh, to use the older language, uh, the passions, uh, are an important part of human nature from the classical perspective. It is a very important part of human nature. In fact, you must not neglect the, the feelings or the passions of, your, of students. You must not because they're driven by them particularly young children. They're driven by their desires, their passions, by their hearts. Uh, appetites not, in the sen not only in the sense that they, they hunger after things, but they desire things. They're driven by their desires. Uh, Plato recognizes this, and so do all the teachers of old. But what they insist on is that the passions must be tempered or directed, and they must be directed by what is true and what is good and what is beautiful and not just simply what appeals, what you desire in that particular moment. You mustn't let your passions uh, lead you. You must be re led rather by what is reasonable, what you can argue, what you can demonstrate, and best of all, what has been proved by the example of wise people throughout the ages. Do what the wise have done. That's what education used to be. It was training in wisdom and virtue. Come the Romantics, there is a decided shift. As I say, towards the feelings. And it is against reason and it's against authority. And so we don't want to learn from the past, we want to learn from the present, and we will see how that plays out in the future. And it, it, does, con it does entail a certain view of life as well, which is very much organic. The organic view of life is that um, everything relates to everything else all the time without distinction. It's an ecological view of life, if you will. So my environment is always influencing me and I respond to my environment, but there's no sense of human agency distinct from that. I can't act upon it because I'm always being acted upon. My passions are always moving me. I can't stand back and say, I'm not going to do what I'm being pushed to do. I, I'm effectively um, the sole product of my environment, and even worse than that, my society. My si society is pushing me to be a certain way, and I can't really resist that. Now, when this gets applied 
further into theories to explain human motivations, then we get the discipline we call psychology, which will say that we're motivated by subconscious desires. Freud calls it what? The id. The ego, the superego, and the id. The id's just the desires that, we're, that are motivating us even if we're not aware of them, they're driving us. It can be put into biological theory in terms of genetics. My genetics are driving me to certain actions. I'm not conscious of them, but they're still pushing me in certain ways. They're determining my future. So, um, and that's Richard Dawkins' premise in his book, The Selfish Gene. Our genes are actually, we think that we're making choices, actually uh, we are being determined by processes that we're oblivious to, but they're still driving us to do things. And it's natural, and they always appeal to nature in this. But again, the idea of human rationality, the ability to say yes or no in accordance with whether something is true or false is being undermined here. Comments or questions at this point? I mean, I threw a lot at you all at once. I do that. It'll make more sense when we look at the poem, I think. And then maybe the question might come. Let me look at the first poem. So I'm going to look at two poems today to illustrate this. The first one's called We Are Seven. Both are by Wordsworth. We'll look at one by Coleridge or some by Coleridge uh, two classes from now. Uh, this one's called We Are Seven. And um, it's, uh, it, it's a look at childhood and the way in which children perceive things and also simultaneously a way in which adults engage with children and, and try and reason with children and children see things differently. And what we'll, what we'll get from the interaction is a sort of a conflict between the authority figure, the adult, and the child. And it will be quite clear in the context of the poem that we will find that the child and the child's perspective is being misunderstood by the adult. And the child has a point. So let me just read it first of all. I'll try and put it on the screen behind me. We are seven, it's called. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its, feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering, looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell, she answered. Seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet ye are seven. I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. Then did the little maid reply, Seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, 
sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together around her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then, said I, if they two are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply, O oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead, two are dead, their spirits are in heaven. "'Twas throwing words away, for still the little maid would have her will, and said, "'Nay, we are seven. So in this little, it's hardly a ballad, but you can see there's a story here. There's an exchange between two characters, a figure, the main protagonist, an adult speaking to a child, and the child responding back. They have a disagreement about what the facts of the matter are. But it's set, the stage is set by the very first stanza here. <coughs> and the child's perspective, the, the innocence of the child is being, just as Blake in his Songs of Innocence and Experience, the child is being portrayed as ignorant of the reality of death. And the story itself will demonstrate the child's ignorance. But he begins with this, and it really begins, and this is sort of interesting, it begins with a long dash, which is an abrupt way to begin. It's, it's more like speech than writing. When I say this, um, the, the long dash used in writing is a novelty in terms of um, the printed word. You will not get this in, the, in ancient literature. You won't get it in biblical literature, really. It's more characteristic of speech that we interrupt or begin in the middle of our thoughts with interjections. That when, when you follow people's speech patterns, they rarely speak in complete sentences. They speak in half sentences. And we get used to that. It's very difficult, by the way, if you're a non-native speaker to follow people who speak like that. It's one of the difficulties that you learn to read in sentences and, and think in complete sentences. But when we speak, we often don't. And uh, again, if people are native speakers with you, then there's no problem following them. But following a person who speaks like that, but for somebody who, for whom their language is new, very difficult. Uh, this is more patterned after speech rather than writing. And you'll note that, that uh, Wordsworth's diction here is, like Blake's, very simple. There's no word here that you'll struggle to understand. The words are short. You'll note that they uh, alternate in terms of rhyme. Child, breath, limb, death, breath and death, girl, curl, said, head alternating rhymes, that will carry through throughout the, like the first stanza is a little bit unusual and the last stanza has five lines and not four. So there are some discrepancies there, but they begin, it begins with a sort of an abrupt statement. Uh, why abrupt, who knows? But again, this becomes a pattern in romantic and post-romantic writing is that it follows the pattern of speech more than it follows the pattern of the written word, even though it's written down. And this will become characteristic of, of uh, songs after this as well, and writing furthermore. And we will start to get, it's not, we're not here yet, but more and more an internalized form of writing, which we call um, stream of consciousness, where you connect disconnected thoughts with long dashes. You, you know that from novels, where a character is, is we're, telling, we're being given access to a person's thoughts and not to what they say. There's no way of doing this in, in ancient writing. The way it's done on stage by Shakespeare, for example, is in a soliloquy. The character strides to the front of the stage, and that is showing the audience that 
this is what the character is thinking. If you, if you have a, fil a camera and you can film it, then you can demonstrate that it's thinking and not speaking by just having the character look and then hearing his voice inside of his head. But you can't do that on stage. They, Shakespeare uses a soliloquy. Hamlet walks up and says, to be or not to be, that's the question. That's what he's thinking. Nobody else hears him give the soliloquy, right? And, and writing becomes more and more a reflection of what's going on in our heads rather than the uh, words that we say to other people. And again, this is a way of, to some degree, working against tradition and convention and suggests that there's an interior reality that's more real than the exter exterior reality which everyone else experiences through when we speak to them or when we act. And a suggestion that that, that reality is superior to our words and deeds, for that matter. And so you'll get people, actually, uh, who will object in, uh, in public uh, debates, uh, protesting that you don't understand how I feel, as if that were an argument. And say, well, I will understand if you tell me, then I will understand. And they'll say, no, you can't possibly understand, because you're not me, which is true. <laughs> But it ought not to be a, an obstacle to communication, but it is presented as that. And you will get people that will uh, furthermore dig their heels in and uh, suggest that because of this obstacle, they ought, their, their vantage point ought to be respected and ought to win the day because they're upset enough. So there's effectively a, a, ta a temper tantrum. Do you know what I'm talking about? You must know what I'm talking about. And by the way, the person who loses their temper or cries in public wins the debate. Especially if it's a child. It's all over at that point. Because something terrible has been done at that point. Again, this is a, the product of romantic sensibilities being accepted by the public at large. Uh, it gets pushed in the education system here it's presented as a dialogue between a child and the adult. Now, the child expresses something true for, from her perspective, and that is that she remembers her brothers and sisters, even the ones that are gone. And actually, they're right there in the grave beside her. And there's even gri the, the, the graves have green on them. There's life there. There's a connection still. They're still connected. My f I still have feelings. I, I feel there are seven. The adult says, but two of them are dead, and so actually there aren't seven, there are only five of you now, making a different point. But the child's point is that I feel there are seven, and we are drawn into the perspective of the child. We think that the child has been misunderstood by the adult in the exchange. Right? The adult's point is perfectly clear. There were seven. Two died, now there are five. This is the world of appearances. The child's world is, to some degree, larger than that. It's not affected by death. Wordsworth explains at the beginning, a simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should it know of death? And then this story demonstrates the point. And the answer is nothing. But we also get from this the subtle point, which is, to some degree, the child's view of life is broader and deeper than the adult's. So the experience of the adult actually misses something of the vitality of the child's perspective, where, where thought and feeling are not disconnected. And that will, go, that will then become a theory of the power of primitive cultures having superior poetry to advanced cultures. It will have a certain, there's a certain force of argumentation there. It's by, it's by implication rather than an actual, actual argument. The actual argument will also be given. But a belief in this day that primitive literature is superior more emotionally expressive and truer to human nature, it comes to the fore. 
And at this time then, it's not only uh, ancient literatures, but particularly those from, cu from cultures that are not uh, written cultures. So oral cultures are considered to have superior culture to uh, advanced civilizations precisely because it's not written down. It's closer to nature. It's closer to feeling. Whereas the written word is closer to reason and closer to argument. It's closer to logic because the word logic is connected with the word, right? The logos. So let me give you a funny story here. This becomes a, this is not Wordsworth's in invention, by the way. It's a, a common sentiment from the time, let's say of Rousseau onwards. I mentioned Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, that there is a, a nobility to the primitive experience which makes it such that we can learn from the noble savages, the natives, whatever. And it be, it's so influential that in the 18th century, uh, there is a poem written by a Celtic bard, when I say Celtic, Scottish. And the poet's name is Ossian, O-S-S-I-A-N. Uh, discovered by a Scottish professor by the name of McPherson. And it's, it's, he finds the fragments of an old poem that had hitherto been undiscovered. The Celtic language is largely, uh, ha has no written vestiges or very few, but it's a sort of a, an epic by Ossian. And all over Europe, people are praising Ossian and his sublime poetry. This is better than anything written by a modern writer. Look at this, and they keep talking about the sublimity of the poem. And uh, from figures as far-reaching as Goethe in Germany uh, to um, your English uh, contemporaries, let's say Dr. Johnson, although Dr. Johnson is a little suspicious of, uh, of the poem and isn't quite as enthralled with it. What's interesting is that it is being presented by all of the literary establishment as the, this is the model going forward of poetic excellence. We ought to be imitating what Ossian does here. Look at, look at the diction, look at the way the poetry works. And then it's discovered that McPherson is a fraud and that the poem, he wrote it himself. He made it all up. And immediately the poem gets dropped. Nobody talks about it anymore. And uh, they act as if it never happened. So my question, uh, in, which I think is sort of funny, but my question in this is if the poetry and the qualities of the poetry were so great, what's the difference whether it was made written down and made up by McPherson or whether it actually came from an old Celtic bard by the name of Ossian. What's the difference? Does it matter whether it comes from a, an ancient Celtic poet or, does it, or whether it was penned by one of our contemporaries? What's the difference? If it's good poetry, it's good. If it's not, it's not. But it doesn't become good or bad just because of the writer. But they think it does. So that exposes something about what I'm discussing here. It no longer is about the objective qualities of the poem. It's more about the character of the person, his, his or her profile, that determines what good writing is thereafter. Striking. And I think it is to this day uh, one of the criteria that it's used. The identity of the writer matters more than the power of the, of the writing itself. Yes? Sort of, except, I mean, so you're talking about his motivation, sure, but that doesn't mean that if, if people thought that the poetry was good, it doesn't matter whether he's a bad man, the poetry would still be considered to be good. Like the qualities of it would be effective. True. Well, no?
Yep. About what they've done in their personal lives. Right. Uh, Objectively, it, sure, they might have, they, they do have some, some good wisdom there, but also it still is tainted by their legacy. Yes, yes, and so, um, I mean, I can think of various examples there, but, um, and you probably can as well, or you might even have one in particular in mind. Um, it is the case, and it is the case when, uh, um, in Christian circles, there is a line being connected between a person's character and his teaching, and vice versa, because there's a certain expectation for behavior, which again, in, you, you mentioned Christian teaching, that the Christian teacher will, be, will act in a Christ-like fashion. If, on the contrary, he betrays that and has actually indulged in immoral acts and so forth, then the teaching is connected to the character. And you wonder whether the teaching is actually as good as it all as it appeared at that point. But there is no such belief in this system that, that um, there is a, a, a model of good character. It's just expressive of a nature which is fundamentally good. And all natures are fundamentally good. I mean, I guess the fact you, you could say, to your point, that since McPherson is the product of a civilized culture, that uh, all he's done is express the, uh, the decadence of his culture, and he's managed to dupe the rest of the people living at the same time that it was actually original and sublime and good poetry, in which case they're all ashamed of themselves. But they don't drop the idea that ancient poetry from, uh, from natives or from uh, ancient cultures is superior to ours. They don't drop it. They think what, what's closest to nature is, is best. And that's represented here in Wordsworth's poem, We Are Seven. The child is closer to nature. The adult has been civilized. The adult looks at things in a different way. Why do we side with the child? Because we think that the child uh, the child's feelings are not being adequately accounted for by the adult in the determination, but they're dead, which we all get. But the child doesn't get. Is the child wrong? Comment or question again? Because of his impediments or his handicaps, in this case, he doesn't have the capacity to hear. Yeah, I think it's extraordinary that a man who has lost his hearing is able to compose musical works which he can no longer hear. It's not that he was always deaf, but he lost his hearing. Same thing we would say about Milton. He writes Paradise Lost when he's blind. In fact, he doesn't write them, he dictates them, his daughters write them down. That adds something to the, the sort of mystique of the work. But does, it, is, does that fact make the work a better work? I don't think so. Like if Beethoven wrote bad concerts, bad compositions, we're not going to talk about Beethoven. It's because it's a, it's a good work, and the fact that he's deaf makes us marvel that much more. I'll give you another example. Mozart was a childhood prodigy mentioned. And again, childhood prodigies are strongly promoted in the romantic sensibilities. They're always looking for the, the, the childhood prodigy, the genius that doesn't follow the rules. Like the, the, uh, we can t so when you teach literature, you're teaching the conventions, the rules, the genres, the, the forms. I can talk about uh, rhyme and meter and use of language and so forth. You can teach those things. But what I can't do is give somebody the nature that, uh, of somebody like Shakespeare that apparently, or at least so it is said, breaks the conventions and follows his own rules. And that's what's said in this period. 
that the person that defies the conventions and acts as if he were a law unto himself, th that's the true poet, that's the true artist. So there's a strong uh, bias towards the unconventional. And that goes so far as to regard even figures that were historically regarded as the opposite of exemplary, like a criminal. You don't want to follow the path of a criminal, right? That leads to a bad outcome. You do bad things, it leads to bad life. You don't want to be like a criminal. Well, in this period, criminals are regarded as heroic. They're often misunderstood. And so you get the emergence in this period even not only of unconventional heroes, but even anti-heroes. They're called Byronic heroes. I'm not going to look at Byron, but somebody who goes against the conventions. He actually may do things wrong. He may act just like the criminals do, but he fights for justice, like Batman, the Dark Knight. It's the same thing. Right? The hero suddenly becomes a little bit darker. And the authority figures are a little less good than we thought they would be. Now, if you actually have any real look at literature written before this, we will find that the heroes of, of ancient literature are never presented in the way that they're caricatured as uh, being, namely without faults. Aeneas has extraordinary faults. So does Odysseus, so does Achilles. Their, Achil their, their faults are obvious to the reader because the poet makes us aware of their faults. That doesn't diminish their greatness. They have faults. But in this period, it is very black and white. There's the good guys and there's the bad guys. It's presented as polar opposites. There's there's some, a, a natural innocence and then there's a corrupted experience and the experience is corrupting and corrosive. Does it make any sense at least? I'm, I'm getting you trying to follow a shift in sensibilities. Let me move on then to our second poem. This is called, no, oh, it's an extraordinary 